babes, Jess here, and welcome to Tiny Table Mini Mukbang, the show where you geek out a lot with a little bit of food. And today we have some entremet or layered mousse cakes from With View With Love, and we are talking about ethics and food journalism. For those of you who are like, what? Seriously, this is actually still an ongoing major problem, and it impacts what you see online every day, so we gotta talk about it and eat some mystery cakes. She told me what they were, but do I remember? No, I do believe there's some red velvet for the taking though. So we're gonna start with the teeny macaron. Give it just a little bop. Very delicately soft, a little bit of a chew, a little bit of a berry note. Let's try that one. So food ethics. We are not going to talk about the whole set of it because, dear goodness, I was talking with a friend of mine about it earlier, actually, and he was like, like, don't get us started about, say, fair trade, which is its own can of worms. But I wanted to talk about ethics in food journalism while it is, ooh, that looks quite lovely. It's intense, it's important, and I'm not kidding when I say it's on everything you see. Some kind of a maybe that's a cherry one in there. We get this guy around. There we go. So the reason I brought it up specifically today is that I'm testing these. This is a first impression of her cakes. There's a whole range here for me to try. I've actually got more downstairs to go through. I paid for them, but she's interested in working with me at a contest, and so I'll be working with them even more if I like all the cakes. That was a whole cherry. Nice. Pretty nice soft chew. Like Sunday cherry. Nice, gentle, soft flavor. So with all that in my head, I want to talk to you about ethics. I know, not the most exciting sounding, but very important. So if you think about it, food writing in the beginning you only heard about restaurants a few ways. Your friends, you going and finding out about them yourself, or something like the New York Times where they had a budget. Hmm. There's some lovely crispy bits in there, maybe Rice Krispies? A nice crispy crunch. Can't see anything though, it doesn't taste like foie tea, more of a crisp than a flaky crunch. And now, with Yelp and Instagram and all of that, a lot of people are creating their own food reviews. Myself included. I think it's really cool. But what fell to the wayside was the, the very strict code of ethics, and nothing really replaced it. So if you don't know, the New York Times code of ethics is stringent. Like, holy crud, you had to visit a restaurant, it had to be like over three months old, you had to visit minimum of twice, usually three times, different times of the day, usually with someone else, under a pseudonym. Mm. This chocolate cherry is quite nice. Not super bold, but I like how pleasantly mellow the two flavors are, and that there's a whole cherry right there. <laughs> Cheers. And... The New York Times subsidizes it by having, well, us read it. And well, there have been attempts for food bloggers to have code of ethics. Um, I was looking it up and the first sort of standardized one was in 2007 and then rewritten in 2009. But honestly, I barely remembered it was a thing. I actually followed the Association of Food Journalists, hold the anonymity because I'm here. But I've talked to other people about this and said, oh yeah, I try to follow AFJ. The number one response I get is, what is AFJ? That tells you how far this is going. Which is really frustrating actually, because the problem is that, mm, wait for that plane to go by. So am I sitting here saying that I think Instagram and Yelp are bad? No, the opposite. What I'm actually having a problem with is that we lack any kind of way for anyone to be 
ethical. Like, I follow a pretty strict code of ethics on my thing where I'm doing this because I request that I've tried a place at least twice and that I go several times or try several things from different methodologies so I can at least be as honest and accurate as possible. But is there a way for me to show that to you? Not on Instagram. There's no sticker that says, this person is ethically sound and trustworthy. On the flip side, it's not like I went to culinary school. You know, I have a background in biology. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time to become a food writer by a complete accident. Let's try this one next. Oh, it's got a nice dense shell. Lovely, you see the cracking happening. And that's not knocking myself either. Like that's a pretty common thing is someone falls into food writing in some way. You have that aha moment. And nice chocolate creamy notes. see the inside. Here we go. Oh, lovely. It's probably the cream cheese. Red velvet, maybe? This might be the chocolate cream cheese. Mm. Very dark chocolate with cream cheese. Creamy cheesy, creamy cheesy. Yes, mm, creamy cheesy, creamy cheesy. For those of you who know that reference. That is old. And little nice bits of crispy bits again. I feel like I'm eating Rice Krispies. Not complaining, but okay. At the end of the, oh, this might be the caramel one. Oh, there's some caramel, nice. At the end of the day, I am someone who has been writing professionally in some way for several years now, but that doesn't make necessarily my viewpoint good or bad, it's just a viewpoint and I happen to have an ethical standard to follow it. This is, hmm, how would I phrase this? What we're seeing here on the flip side is that I've been hearing these reports about Instagram people who literally go and take a photo and don't eat the food. Oh, that's some nice caramel. Really soft, but a lovely bitter note to it. Nice burnt sugar note. Mm. Very nice. Need some more of those, all very dense together. And taking a photo for the gram and then not eating the food, that is uncool. Like, holy freaking crud, I am so distracted by caramel and offended by that. And it's totally fine if you don't like the food, that's different. But I feel like Instagram isn't the place to showcase food you don't like. And that's not even the half of it. I mean, we have the whole thing with food events. So a lot of Instagrammers, oh yes, that's distracting. <laughs> that's good. A lot of Instagrammers, we see the huge spreads of food. Those are from food events. a bad thing but they are heavily curated by the makers of the food and on one hand it's great to have a large quantity of food to try and so I do go to some events but I go to very few one thing there's very few food events in Seattle that are dessert focused but more importantly I have to find ones where I benefit and my audience benefits from my attending and that's a little bit tougher just because if it's at the event and it's done perfectly, is that what you're going to experience? Will it be that food stylingly gorgeous? And that's what always worries me is that like, how much of it is my getting special treatment because I have a period in my Instagram number. And that's not even including things like, I'm a known entity to most of the Seattle dessert scene. Not only that, I'm friends with most of the Seattle dessert scene. I try to make that really obvious in my content, but I, 
I'm buddies with a lot of these people because they're cool people and you hang out with them enough. Like, I know most of the crew of Chocolopolis. <laughs> you know, I, I hang out with most of them. And I still really respect them as a brand and that's separate of my friendship. But I will to take that into consideration just because that's something you have to take into consideration. You shouldn't just ignore it or hide it. And so I try to be public about that. But that's why I did so many things with them was that I was like, you guys are amazing and no one knows about you. And I want to highlight that. Mm. I like in this one over that one. Still both good. And that's my decision. But I think all of this rambling aside, what I'm really thinking about is how to sort of build a more ethical system for everybody. And I really think it, oh no, I think it comes to really two points. And that's really you as watchers and consumers and myself as a consumer, we need to be aware and request more transparent everything. If there's a maker you like, encourage them to be more accurate and upfront about if it's a paid promotion or if it's a first impression or if it's an event. And myself as a maker, all of us, we need to be more transparent. I wish there was a way to put ethical codes out on Instagram so I could say, hey, this is how I do stuff. And also I'd like that to be there just because for me with my allergy pile, you're never gonna see me cover coffee. It's kind of a big thing in Seattle. So if you're interested in finding coffee desserts, you're not gonna find any. I, I can't even go near most of them. But those are things that probably you care about as someone looking up Seattle stuff. So I'm not necessarily your cup of tea. I do cover tea desserts. Dear goodness, I love tea desserts. Oh dear, that's, this is good stuff. And I'm not sure how to really start getting that discussion going just because Everyone runs in different circles. So like, I know a good number of the Seattle food scene, but there are more established bloggers, like Molly Weisenberg. I've never seen her. I've never met her. I don't even hang out near that crowd. They, they seem cool. I'm just, I'm not in that crowd. So short of getting someone who's really big and getting some kind of um, ethics discussion going, which is what I'm hoping this will inspire you to do, we're not going to get there today. But I do think at the very least being aware of what's going on, it's going to hopefully make you a more informed consumer. So the, moral of oh, no, no. so the moral of the story is this. A lot of ethics stuff is weird. That's nothing new. Go on, go on. And there's things you can do about it. You can request more transparency. You can even just ask if it was an event. If it looks like an event, it was almost certainly an event. Just point that out there. And ask people to disclose how they got their stuff. Like, that's a good thing. Like, okay, backing up a bit. This is not really got to me actually. So when I was a more active food writer, I need water. I was going to all these food events. I mean like the big conferences and stuff like that. It's like IFBC, IACP, which doesn't mean anything to you, but um, like the International Association of Culinary Professionals or the International Food Bloggers Conference. A lot of these things. I didn't go to everyone, but went to a bunch. They give out a lot of freebies and not just big freebies though. There was some big freebies I will let you know. I once got two free round trip tickets anywhere Alaska flew. Like, it's nonsense. But even ignoring that, like, how do I even put this? All the freebies. There's so many free food items and it actually gets to the point where you stop realizing how much things cost. And I know it's a major brag. Like, 
we are living in a world of food insecurity. As someone who's been on food stamps, I totally understand just how much of a brag that was. It, but it's, it's an actual problem because one, this should be going to other people, but more importantly for you, it impacts what gets covered because your concept of the pricing is all wrong. I would have to actually go to grocery stores. Ooh, is this a strawberry? I think this is a red velvet. And I just let you see that. I'd have to figure out how much things cost on my own because I didn't always have the MRSRP listed. Strawberry jam and creamy cheesiness. She actually was really cool when we were talking. I asked her like, how much strawberry? And she was checking with me and made sure that it was a safe way for me to eat it. So that was very nice. But yeah, like, I remember going into Safeway and going, how much does this tuna cost? Because I don't know. And <laughs> I have to just make sure that I wasn't cr promoting a product that was bad for, for you peeps. And that was a real problem. Which is so weird to say right now. And then there are all these like hotels that are like, no influencers, no way. And on the flip side, people are getting so much free stuff. I got some stuff recently that are like, yeah, free hotels for influencers if you're big enough. And that's what's going on. So on one hand, you have people who won't let influencers in. On the other hand, people just living it up trying to get influencers in the front door. It's a mess. Hmm. And I just miss being able to eat strawberries whenever I want. <laughs> Simple problems. There we go. So, it's weird. The answer is it's weird. And I actually stopped going to a lot of food conferences just because I didn't feel like they were, I'm not a good match, really, for one thing. YouTubers aren't a big thing yet within the system, and especially not people who don't do recipe work. But those are where all the brand deals go down. Like, who boy? Okay, you wanna talk about weird ethics stuff. This one time, I mean, not them, but it's just, if you wanna talk about weird things that have happened, I got shipped to New York to go listen to an egg conference, like an egg bill. Like, it, there's so much going on. And it's not dinging people that are involved. It was actually really cool to listen to. It's just, this is what's going on behind the scenes. And I was small back then. Holy crud, I was small. But that's the world of influencing is that once you are going to the right places, meeting the right people, you get more stuff for free with more push to do stuff that might be unethically sound. Though I realize something here. I have not explained why going to a restaurant multiple times is necessarily required. Now yeah, look, it sounds obvious. Go multiple times, see how the restaurant performs. It's that what I found is that you actually have to go three times in most cases. And so what'll happen is usually I have a really good experience and then a not as great, and then I have to see what if an in-between type thing happens, which is pretty common. and. I look at it like there's going to be restaurants that are very good and the restaurants that I think you would appreciate and in between. But figuring out where each one lies does take a little bit of finagling and also trying a bunch of different things because a chef might be better at one thing or another. And that's not a bad thing, it just is. But it is inconsistently utilized by most folks. Mm. They've all had the same crunchy thing going on. I'm trying to find a crunchy. Oh, okay. 
So that's a good call. All right, this is actually really cool. So what she's using, I'm not sure what brand, but there's an item known as a croquant. And that's the Velro name for it, probably has an actual generic name. But what they are is basically, imagine a Rice Krispie cereal wrapped in a little bit of chocolate. These are actually banned in my house because we eat them so fast. Dear crud, they're, they're really easy to eat by the handful. But it's kind of ingenious here because then with the chocolate acting as a defense against the mousse, they'll stay crispy longer. And because she put it right next to the cream cheese layer, I didn't really taste the outside, I just got the crispiness. Neat. I have seen other ways to do like crispy layers in this kind of a cake, but I've seen a I've seen a lot of different ways they get crispy textures into these kind of mousse cakes, but I don't think I've seen a lot of people play with croquants inside, and I think that's really cool. Nice. I wish the strawberry piece would stay in though. It's okay, small things. I feel like as I'm finishing up here, I really should comment that there's not a seedy underbelly of these things going on. It's all pretty transparent when you're in the system. Basically, the more active you are and the more your engagement and your growth goes, the more invites you get, period. Whether or not you accept them is up to you, but they do end up being kind of like YouTube sponsorships and just being a lot. And I feel like right now the big thing is that on YouTube and in blogs, it's much easier to be transparent. It's not actually easy to be transparent on Instagram. And that is where I'm not sure where to go. Cause so, I mean, I can put a link in my link tree telling you exactly my code of ethics, but Will you have the impetus to click? That's where we're stuck. So yeah, I totally encourage you, like, ask your favorite influencers where they got stuff. Ask them to be transparent. Ask them how they do their food reviews. Do they go multiple times? How do they do sponsorships? Like, I want us to be able to have this really cool space. place where we learn about food and we feel like people who are teaching us about food are teaching us in the best way possible both for themselves and for the makers so that we can have way more tasty food and hopefully have fewer freaking closures I know it's changed energy but I'm not handling the Mount Townsend Creamery closure well or Arate chocolate or cookie counter I'm having a very tough time with all these closures and so I'm hoping that maybe if we talk ethics, maybe I'll also encourage more discussions, period. And maybe people will go to more restaurants. Uh. With that, thank you again for joining me for another Tiny Table Mini Mukbang. I definitely rambled, but I hope it was an interesting ramble in the behind the scenes underbelly of food ethics in journalism. And <laughs> let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to try next or talk about next. Clearly I've got options, but I'm always down for more cake and more ethics. And with that, I'll catch you awesome peeps next week. Later! I can't believe I ate all of those. I can't believe I rambled for 25 minutes while eating all of those. <laughs>